everyone and welcome to the SaaS community channel where we share what we know about building SaaS products and SaaS companies. I'm your host, Gwen Shapira, and this episode is extra exciting to me. First of all, because I'm here on my own for the first time in this channel without a guest. I hope I'll be able to keep your interest as well as my awesome guests have been able to. And second, this is the first episode I'm recording of since I started working on SAS full time. So it's a special episode for me, but it's a short one. So let's get to it. So basically, I'm here to sh- what I'm here to share is that in the last week, I learned a bunch of interesting things about APIs, and I thought it's worthwhile sharing them with the community. So first of all, why are APIs important for anyone building SaaS? Two reasons. First is because we are in an API economy, and it makes sense to use a lot of the APIs that are available out there. And second, because it makes a lot of sense to find ways in which your product can participate in this SaaS economy and benefit from possibly new kinds of users that you didn't expect or new use cases that you didn't expect. So let me dive a bit more into both aspects, the consuming APIs and also creating your own APIs. So first of all, and maybe that was the biggest discovery that I had in the last week, literally everything that is not really your core business logic, the innovative parts in your own product is available by someone out there with an API, as a service, with an API. So you probably know Stripe and Square do payments. You probably know that Shopify has APIs. You probably know about Twilio. But there is a lot that is completely and utterly uh, new to me. I didn't know that you can do background checks (laughs) as a service via an API. I didn't realize that you can integrate search in your application via an API. I didn't know you can do fraud detection as an API, videos as APIs. And maybe the things that blew my mind the most is the databases with APIs. Because, you know, I've been doing databases for a very long time. And it was always, you know, you product, basically protocols, SQL clients, maybe, you know, JDBC kind of thing. Like, and not just JBC is not an API, but you know what I mean? We're talking about like REST APIs being part of how APIs are happening in the web these days. So turns out that there is a lot of fairly new, but exciting databases with REST APIs. And I think FaunaDB is maybe the, the more well-known one, but there is a bunch of others. And then on top of all that, there are things like Zapier, which is basically... API to manage everyone else's APIs and kind of tie them together. So it can get very, very meta. And this is first pretty cool. I would say that these days, if there is anything that you need to do, which isn't your business, look for an API to do it. There is probably, you know, HR is an API and the CFO is an API as well. Just don't assume that you have to do things yourself that are not your core business value. Now, some people took this to the extreme and created an entire software architecture philosophy around that, which is very new to me and I thought was super cool for a lot of people. So there is this thing called Jamstack and They say it's the modern way to build websites and APIs that deliver better performance. And the idea behind Jamstack is that you basically, so first of all, Jam stands for JavaScript APIs and a markup, but really JavaScript and APIs. The idea is that you create basically static websites and as in 
all the interactivity is with JavaScript, but there is no data showing up from a database to be part of the experience. So the page itself is statically rendered. And at the next step, everything more interactive that you need, because then you may need a database, you may need a lot more than just a database. Everything else is being provided via APIs, either as part of the API economy, as that we discussed, all those different services, or worst case scenario, nobody else did it. You cannot really do this. This is business logic that maybe has to be in the back end. You cannot really do it yourself on your uh, directly in JavaScript on the website. You go and build serverless functions in something like AWS Lambda. So I think they have a nice picture of what it looks like. And you can see here. So basically, you just run to the client side, just the front end. You run it to CDN. And then all those microservices are either function as a service that you wrote or um, APIs to a backend that someone else has wrote, which means that you don't have to manage your own backend. It's you just people can write entire websites without writing a backend. I don't know if it blows your mind as much as it blows my mind. Like those <laughs> entire things are kind of missing in action. Uh, so the, the reason it's good news is twofold. A, front-end engineers can now no longer need back-end engineers in order to do cool stuff, which is, I think, fairly good for them. It's always nice to feel uh, independent. Like we back-end engineers could always write CLI and APIs and pretend nobody needs UI, but they really front-end engineers couldn't really do the reverse. So now they can. Now they can say that they don't need us anymore. The other thing that is really cool is, if you remember, they kind of build it as better performance. And it took me a while to wrap my head around why would it be better performance? You still have a backend, right? You don't run it, but you're still making all those calls. But the thing is, if you think about it, all your backends is driven by people who are really good at what they do, right? It's like the Stripe and the AWS and the Twilio's of the world. Like, they're good at it. They know how to scale it. They scale it globally if you need to be available globally. And then your code runs on CDN, which is obviously very scalable and runs globally. So you basically don't have to worry about the performance. You trust people who are already very, very good at doing it to do it for you. So it seems like an amazing architecture. I was very excited to discover it exists. Now it's fairly new. There's probably a bunch of gotchas that I haven't thought of that may make the whole thing tank, like who knows, but it kind of feels good to see new types of architectures. I have to admit that since microservices and event-driven, I haven't really seen new architectural ideas. And, you know, I'm this is the kind of stuff I love, so I kind of love it. Now, this is just part of it. This is the part where you use other people's APIs. But what you really want is to participate in it to make your own application available for other people who are building their own applications. And the way you do that, well, you need to have a public API. And I know it sounds funny, but I haven't built public APIs before in the way that the API economy refers to, right? I worked a lot on Kafka. We had a public protocol. We had open source clients. We had a public Java SDKs that I contributed to but it's not like a public REST API for an online service. So that's a bit different. I worked with people who did it, but I never did it myself. So I was kind of looking into the best practices and how people do it. And basically what I discovered is that there is a standard called open API and like it's an open spec and like all modern languages, it is basically a bunch of YAML. And it allows you to define your API. So you can see that you have a pass, and I have slash pet. And if I do a post to slash pet, then I can uh, submit all those parameters. And the parameter is really just a pet. So let's go see what is a pet. And you actually have an entire schema. A pet has a name and a photo. So I, this, as you can see, this is incredibly readable. And you just describe your entire interface of your application right here. And then the cool thing is that 
because it's an open standard, there is so many tools available once you do it. So you can actually generate an entire Spring website with that or in other languages if you are more into whatever kids use these days, I guess. Uh, so you can generate your website, at least the front of your website. You still have to write your own implementation, I guess. But you can generate a lot of your website just out of the spec, just take a lot of those grant work, you know, the whole copy paste thing that is very boilerplate, it basically does it for you. And then it doesn't just generate the website, it goes and generates docs for you. And those are pretty nice docs. They look good. They have, you know, they're very structured, so it's easy to read. They have examples, and these are all example values that are actually provided by you in the spec. So you can really see a developer out there who wants to use your API reading the docs and understanding exactly what to do. If they want to play with it, they also have this uh, kind of like copy paste CRL. And this is actually a paid part of Swagger Hub. So they're not paying me to say that it's awesome, but they do kind of host a mock backend for you if you want to just try out and play with your API. So what, what they provide is pretty nice, but the entire generation, it's all open spec and all open tools and you can generate the docs in the open. Though I think the only thing that is really paid is hosting your mocks, but you can always generate and host your own mocks. And I strongly recommend generating and hosting your own mocks because what happens in a lot of companies is that you have the front end team and the back end team and they meet together and they agree on an API and then each one kind of goes and implements stuff against the spec. And then they meet three weeks later and try to integrate and discover that a lot of things kind of went off in those three weeks. And it's actually a lot of integration work that was not planned and not expected because things kind of went sideways versus if the first thing you did is generate the application interfaces and generate mocks for them and generate tests for them, and then the front-end team could actually test against those mocks that are hosted somewhere, and there would be matching tests, and the back-end team would just test their implementation against those uh, generated tests that make sure that you adhere to the spec. It looks like things would... Uh, work a lot easier and you would need to you wouldn't have so many surprises after three weeks of implementation and the other nice thing is that once it generates tests for you if you make changes to those apis those nightly tests or part of your build tests would obviously fail uh, if you break compatibility so having kind of aspects that you have to support and ongoing uh, compatibility checks is so so important and i'm sure Everyone heard me say that like a gazillion times. Uh, now, the other part in having public APIs is the world will need to discover them. I found out that Postman, which, by the way, has a very nice um, kind of like CURL on steroids if you develop on APIs for the desktop. So it makes it a bit easier to test out things and compose requests. They have something that they call world of APIs where you can really register your own and look for other people's APIs. So you can see that you can have WhatsApp here, you have Stripe, you have uh, Salesforce. And if you start drilling down, you can basically see other people's APIs in here. So they even have a chat log. And then I discovered that, for example, if I want to see how do I a, maintain a calendar versus via the Nihilus API, I can kind of see, okay, if I get a calendar, I can actually input all those different parameters, click send and get a result. Um, if I want to do a post, they actually let me, you know, you can edit the body. I can uh, even see some generated tests. So it, this is not, maybe not as pretty as the docs that I saw in Swagger generate, but it's very interactive. And I like the idea that I can kind of make changes and enter things and try out other people's API, like the discovery aspect that all the APIs in the world are registered in here and I can just try them out is kind of amazing to me. So yeah, first of all, no, nobody paid me to do this episode. Uh, so I kind of showed, you know, Swagger tools and Postman. Uh, that's what I discovered and I liked it. So I'm showing this to you as well. But 
if you know other tools that you think are awesome and I should know about them, please put it here in the comments. Those are just things that I heard about, not necessarily, like this is not sponsored content or anything like that. And not even a recommendation since as I said, I've only been doing it for like a week. So it's more of a discovery thing. So yeah, I hope you learned something useful. If, if you think there's more things I can learn from you, please leave it here in the comment or join the SAS community Slack and share it with everyone. We have over 800 members now. This is very exciting to me. So you can join and share it with 800 of your closest collaborators. Um, if you got all the way to the end of this episode, I'm guessing that what I say is at least a bit useful to you. So I'm going to ask you for a favor. In the links for this episode, down here below, I'm going to link, first of all, I'm going to link to a lot of resources about the API economy and some interesting podcasts and blogs and all kinds of things I found. But I'm also going to link to a customer discovery form. As I mentioned earlier, I'm now doing my own company and I'm building a SaaS product and I really want to take the community along on this journey with me. So I really want to get your feedback about what I'm building. And at this point, I'm still a bit shy about it. We've only been doing it for a week. I'm not ready to share everything in public, but I would love to jump on a call with you, show you what I have, get your feedback, discuss it with you, and even buy you a cup of coffee to uh, compliment. Uh, so if you want to jump on a call with me and give me this feedback, I would really appreciate it. Fill in this form. It has like three questions about who you are. And then I ask for email. It's not going to any marketing thing at all. Uh, not the list because I don't have any marketing thing set up yet. Uh, so the only way I'll use it is personally email you and say, thank you so much. When is a good time to meet? essentially. So I would really, really appreciate if you do that. And that's it for this week. See you again next week.